preservation of and increased access to the 92nd Street Y Humanities Audio Archives is generously funded by the National Endowment for the Humanities. All right. Well, first I want to pass along some news that some of you may have missed. Last week, the Beijing Evening News reported that the US Congress is threatening to leave Washington and relocate to either Charlotte or Memphis because the Capitol building is inadequate and obsolete. And the paper, this is the biggest um, daily paper in Beijing, and it ran an architect's drawing of a proposed new Capitol complete with stadium seating and retractable dome. And it quoted Dennis Hastert, don't get us wrong, we love the drafty old building, but the hard reality is it's no longer suitable for a world-class legislative branch. The sight lines are bad, there aren't enough concession stands or bathrooms, and the parking is miserable. It also quoted Jeff LaPointe, a California voter, as saying the building wasn't the problem. Those guys are all just a bunch of spoiled, overpaid crybabies. All right. You aren't buying it. It seems that what happened is the paper's foreign correspondent in Washington typed this story straight from theonion.com. The Onion, as most of you know, is a wonderful, popular, satirical uh, website and tabloid. And a few days later, the Beijing News ran an apology saying that The Onion, I'm quoting, fabricates offbeat news to trick people into noticing them. Meanwhile, John Ashcroft announced that he was expanding the authority of the FBI so that agents could get their news from the World Wide Web and chat rooms, apparently just like the rest of us. And meanwhile, you're going to think I'm changing the subject, but I'm not. Here's what, here's what my inbox looked like this morning. I'm just going to give you some titles because it's better actually not to open this mail. Hey, hottie, email me. Here are the results of your feedback form. Call us. We can help. That one is from somebody identified as tech support. $2,500 confirmed. Please verify your identity. That one's from someone called rewards department. Meet me at four. Oops, James, you've been selected. I saw this and remembered your problem. Grow 10 years younger in 30 days, guaranteed. One less thing to worry about. James, get your college degree. James, we found your match. See photos now. Men, make your bigger already. And by the way, I get just as much mail offering to enlarge my breasts as my penis which proves that we're all just too small. I mean, you get this mail, right? I mean, does everybody, how many people in this room actually have email? Okay, and so this isn't news to you. I assume you're getting the same offers of golf balls and, no? Okay, then, okay, then, then I have bad news, which is I'm just a year or two ahead of you on the curve. And the stuff that I'm talking about is going to be flooding your mailbox very soon. It's, you can't avoid it. Well, you could avoid it. You could just turn it off. All right. So for the rest of the evening, feel free to interrupt and make rude noises if you catch me saying how wonderful a resource the internet is for journalists and students and other information gatherers. Which I, which I might do. My plan is to read something from my new book, a, a piece that's called Multiple Personality Disorder. But before I get there, I want to consider this question of spam. As you know, spam is a technical term, meaning unsolicited commercial email. This junk that floods your inbox. Soon, you too are going to be invited to make money fast, enlarge your sex organs, refinance your mortgage, and send your bank account information to Nigerian revolutionaries who need help laundering $12 million in cash. And then, tomorrow, you'll get the same invitations all over again. All right, it, it's just a nuisance. Before there was spam, there was junk mail, and 
then there were junk phone calls from telemarketers, and then there were junk faxes. And it seems that the First Amendment protects at least the postal version of this. The post office is a public facility. You have a right to write any address on an envelope, insert your annoying and offensive prose, buy a stamp, and dump the thing in the mailbox. So plenty of people argue that there's also a free speech right to send internet spam. So is there? And how many people here think there is or, or there should be? Well, for what it's worth, OK, this is reasonable. I think it's wrong, but, but there's an argument. And there are a lot of people who believe this. Um, the European Parliament just voted in the last few weeks to require an opt-in system for this kind of thing, meaning that you have to choose to give your permission before you can receive unsolicited electronic communication for marketing purposes. That's if you're European. Of course, the notorious problem about the internet is that national boundaries are somewhere between porous and invisible. But for now, at least, it's the US that's the haven for spammers. And I think that's embarrassing. Of, of course, we have the First Amendment. And just today, the Supreme Court has ruled that um, Jehovah's Witnesses have a right to knock on your door. A town someplace was trying to, to uh, force them to register. But they didn't, they didn't rule that you have an obligation to open your door and let them in. And they didn't rule, at least yet, that marketers and hucksters have the same rights as religious organizations and um, people who are electioneering, let's say. Anyway, you can see what I think. Uh, it's not that spam is the worst of the world's evils, but, but it's bad, it's intrusive, it violates the sovereignty we should all have over our inboxes, over our gateways to the world's information conduits. The online world is different. It's the same, but it's different. It's the same because it's just the world we already live in writ large, or speeding up, or intensifying. Book selling, and news delivery, and pornography, and auctions, and political discourse, and game playing, and everything else that we do offline, we also do online now in some fashion or other. But it's different. All these activities are different because when you crank certain knobs far enough, you turn up the volume or you accelerate or you just make things easier and cheaper, you cross a threshold and you discover that the old rules don't apply. They aren't good enough. At some point, quantitative changes become qualitative changes. So the knob that's been turned here is the one that controls cost. That is, the cost of sending one person a marketing message. It's not very expensive to send junk mail through the post office or to make junk phone calls during your dinner. But it does cost money, maybe 50 cents or a dollar. This means they have to exercise some judgment, believe it or not. In cyberspace, just as it costs you essentially nothing, to chat with a pal in Tokyo or browse the Library of Congress, it costs essentially nothing to fling random, illiterate drivel across the planet. So for internet spammers, there is no reality check. So is this the culmination of a century of marketing science? It's the opposite of what the online world was supposed to bring us, the promise or the threat of the internet was supposed to be that marketers would gather such detailed information about our personal habits that they will home in on us like guided missiles. If they have something to sell to the 14 people in the greater Kansas City area who like Thai food and drive a Chevrolet Suburban and listen to crash test dummies, their databases will be ready. At least that's the idea, and it still could happen. Plenty of people are trying to make it happen. But meanwhile, women all over the world continue to wake up every day to new email offering to enlarge their penises. Now, 
Let me digress for a minute and say a word about something different, which is the Y2K crisis. Remember that? It was long, long ago, another millennium, and everyone knew one thing for sure. On New Year's Eve, when the clock struck 12, the world was going to come to an end. Even though you lived through it, do you remember what a fever pitch of hysteria was whipped up over this bit of trivia? Responsible authorities in the government and, I'm sorry to say, the press, warned of power failures, planes falling from the sky, food shortages, bank panics. During most of 1999, you couldn't open a newspaper or turn on the television without hearing some kind of Y2K news. I say news, but of course, there never really was any news. With six weeks to go, that's the end of 1999, the US opened a $50 million crisis center. The state of Ohio actually moved its go government operations into a, an underground bunker eight miles north of Columbus. People all over America stocked up on food, bottled water, guns, and ammunition. By then, hundreds of books had been published, like How to Survive the Coming Crisis, Don't Be Scared, Be Prepared, Building Your Ark. The Y2K Personal Survival Guide had instructions on, I'm quoting, what to include in your home survival kit, how to purify your water, shelf lives of 45 common foods, phone numbers for your vital records for all 50 states, how to select a generator, and more. And there were Y2K cookbooks. And by the way, a fun thing to do is look up these books on Amazon and read the reviews posted by customers. Suffice to say, the tone of the reviews changes dramatically on January 1st. My favorite review reads in its entirely, in its entirety, I'm posting this on January 3rd, Nuff said. Well, my point is, we need to remember to check our collective pulse once in a while. Now that we communicate so fast and so well, and because we communicate so fast and so well, we are more prone than ever to fits of mass hysteria. Information bounces from one channel to the next. Rumors feed on themselves. Anyway, these sort of odd, cultural and psychological things are at the heart of my book. They're the essence, I think, of what just happened. The book is made up of my writing over a period of almost a decade, starting at a time when the World Wide Web didn't even exist, and ending at a time when people who, at least people who followed the stock market, decided that there had been an internet bubble, and now it was bursting. I don't happen to believe that. I think this stuff actually matters, and I think we're just at the beginning. So with all that by way of self-introduction, I'm going to read from the book. This is called Multiple Personality Disorder. Who can you trust online these days? Not me. I seem to have posted Nat King Cole's classic rendition of Naughty Angeline online for the whole world to download free. It's right there in the Alt Binaries Sounds 78 RPM era news group, a forum filled not with messages, but with mostly illicit copies of recorded music digitized in the popular format known as MP3. People are emailing me to ask for more. Thanks for the great posting, says Ms. Madge at home.com. Could you please repost this song as it was incomplete? Thanks again. Well, you're welcome, Madge. I feel so generous and yet so naughty because after all, this music is protected by copyright and Blue Note Records tries to sell it for money. Well, it turns out that the perpetrator of this particular crime was not really me. I'm just getting all his mail because he made up a fake internet identity, skink at around.com, that happens to point to me. 
There are words for this. It appears you have an MP3 poster who has co-opted your domain, explains David Ritz, an expert volunteer monitoring abuse of this kind. Domain names are essential pieces of email addresses like the town names in old style addresses. They're the piece that comes after the at sign. Whitehouse.com is a nice recognizable domain name. Now, whitehouse.com happens to be a pornography site, but that's another problem. When I signed up long ago for around.com, I carelessly arranged for all around.com mail to come to me, all of it, from A at around.com to Z at around.com. I failed to foresee that an easy word like around would be an accidental magnet for people making up false email addresses. So skink at around.com apparently just popped into someone's head, and skink has plenty of company. I get mail meant for scores of creative souls who spontaneously chose to call themselves nowhere at around.com, fooling at around.com, run at around.com, dick at around.com, clown at around.com, I don't leave this lying at around.com, and worse. And I feel I know them. Skink's musical taste runs to 40s blues and modern hammered dulcimer, so we can call him eclectic. Lately, he's been disseminating the works of T-Bone Walker. He also likes golf, if I can judge by his incoming junk mail. I can't stop myself from reading it. Skink is sort of my email cousin. I'm receiving a picture of how people behave when they pretend to be someone else, and it isn't pretty. At best, the online world looks short on faith. Huge pieces of it have become halls of mirrors populated by visitors in clownish disguise. Discussion groups feature angry, suspicious exchanges between people all employing pseudonyms. Here is Bulldog, sniffin at around.com trying to shout, I don't trust you, at someone called I get it now at wow.com, participating in a lunatic fringe bulletin board. I think you want people to send you money. I think you are a fake. He wants this invective to hit his target, but he's failing because his diatribe bounces from one false address to the next. Then I hear from a computer redirecting misaddressed mail at MIT. Sorry, I couldn't find any host named wow.com. This is a permanent error. I've given up. Sorry, it didn't work out. Well, it's said that this robot is the only polite and dependable speaker in the whole bunch, but it's no accident. There's a reason. The machine is the one identifying itself with an honest name and address. Many of us, when we first get online, feel the thrill of being able to play the game without revealing our whole selves. On the internet, nobody knows you're a dog, said Peter Steiner's classic New Yorker cartoon. Our every instinct tells us to protect our privacy, and if we don't think carefully, we're tempted to imagine that privacy and anonymity are the same. Our names have value, after all. Marketers covet them. They list us in their databases and sell our contact information and intimate shopping pref preferences to the highest bidder. So nonstop hit-and-run skirmishing has broken out between the forces of imperialism and rebellion. We natives try to raid their malls and information services and porn sites, grab what we can, and slip away under cover of darkness. How can they be sure we're who we say we are? Authent authentication is hard. The most common real-life technique for authenticating an online visitor requires just a few simple steps. A visitor needs a password to enter a site. The site demands an email address. The visitor hands it over. 
the site sends the password not back to the browser, but by email. If the email address is genuine, the transaction succeeds, identity verified. If not, a total stranger will be getting an unexpected password with some helpful explanation like the following. If you didn't ask for this, don't get your panties all in a knot. You are seeing this message, not them. So if you can't be trusted with your own password, we might have an issue. Otherwise, you can just disregard this message. Now, you'd think internet users would see how pointless it is to have their essential security information forwarded to fake addresses where they themselves will never receive it. But apparently not. So their passwords come my way. I have a password for someone called Bite Me Again, which enables me to download a demo of the Cinepack AVI codec as soon as I figure out what that is. I have a password that gets me past the bouncer at Kelly's bar room, which seems to be a sad sort of chat site. I am identified as Chunky Monkey. I'm here, let's party, I seem to have announced. Rick, too, is saying, I'm here, let's party. Sarah retorts, anybody online? And then, we gone, bye-bye. The Algonquin Roundtable, it isn't. Then I get someone's password for live, fucking, uncensored, and explicit, the net's most shocking explicit site. I could watch their live teens and live sluts their shower cams, college girl cams, dressing room cams, and cams that are even less respectful of the modern woman. These pornographers want my credit card number, of course. So do legions of scam artists who are sending their hopeful missives to my unreal addresses. You posted me a note saying you wanted to make money using the internet, but we're not sure how, writes one trying to communicate with a fake address by using a fake address of his own. All we do is help people find what they're looking for. I want to talk to you. I nor any of my consultants mess around. We are nice people. Sure, but sorry, I'm just too busy. Using another of my nom de plume, somewhere at around.com, I'm apparently participating in this week's Farmer's Market online poll. Someone in London is trying to persuade me, T. Hardy at around.com, to buy the gizmo that everyone's talking about, namely the Executroid Relaxation Module. I'm browsing new cars and real estate. Janet Chong in Singapore has rushed over my year 2000 horoscope, but one of the side effects of my multiple personality disorder is that I've lost track of my sign. As Yosh at around.com, I'm accumulating points at a place called Talk City, but I fear these points are as imaginary as I am. And then, as Bozo the Clown, clown at around.com, I've submitted a service request, priority level top, from the Blanco School's North Room Gym in the Port Orford School District in Southern Oregon. How old am I, anyway? In pre-internet times, anonymity had a long and happy run. We cherish our whistleblowers and dissidents. We know we aren't all fortunate enough to live in communities that protect unpopular forms of expression. We know that anonymity can free us to seek help for drug abuse or mental illness. We may be slow in recognizing, though, how profoundly the character of communication is changing. A fine set of laws and rules of etiquette evolved over centuries to cover modes of expression that we now see were slow and intimate and short range, voices in the town square, notices on the church door, petitions, letters, newspapers. Now these rules must cover cyberspace, this 
instantaneous global democracy where everyone with a keyboard has a voice and every voice carries far and every word lingers for years in archives. Somehow, these rules need to cope with the double-edged character of anonymity online. On the one hand, human rights activists used anonymizer.com to protect Kosovars trying to send out reports on the Balkan War. On the other hand, the same anonymity made it possible for a fanatic signing email as Asian hater to spread fear at the University of California by threatening to hunt down fellow students. Well, we understand the dilemma. On the one hand, freedom from persecution and embarrassment. On the other hand, a mask for criminal or antisocial behavior. On the one hand, the Lone Ranger. On the other hand, the Ku Klux Klan. On the one hand, hoaxes, libel, and fraud. And on the other hand, free speech. But free speech never used to mean nameless speech. It hasn't until now, until the power to broadcast anonymously to millions of listeners. Creating protection for unpopular expression was important and expensive, precisely because everyone knew who those unpopular speakers were. In the ancient, small world, we know from history books and black and white movies. When people stayed in more or less the same place and encountered pretty much the same people year after year, a person's name mattered. If someone's character was besmirched, the damage wasn't easily undone. Reputation stayed with you. Then we noticed that our big, crowded, urban world was different anonymous. Communication by telephone is faceless. We learn early that it's safe to phone the store and say, do you have Dr. Pepper in a can? Let him out. At first, the internet looks like more of the same, more crowded, more wired, faster, just as faceless. But it turns out that cyberspace works differently. Communities form freed from constraints of geography. And that old small town feeling emerges. And in the most successful of these communities, identity and reputation carry significant weight. The auctions at eBay depend as a matter of trust on the site's elaborate system of recording comments by members about other members. The aficionados illegally trading digitized jazz recordings form a community, and so do the stock traders spreading rumors on Yahoo about the companies they're buying and selling. They get to know one another. But can they believe what they think they know? It turns out that half the messages about a company called Harbor Florida Bank Shares came from the keyboard of one Matrix 99, Typical message, storm the Bastille, er, the downtown Fort Pierce office, and demand your $42 per share. So management sued him without knowing who he was, naming him quaintly as John Doe. And many such suits are underway now. However, the courts end up resolving them. The participants in company-oriented message boards at Yahoo and elsewhere are the losers because they will quickly learn that they can't take this form of communication seriously. The people touting and savaging companies are mostly owners and sellers of the stocks, lobbing their little grenades online in hopes of influencing the price. I believe that the, the growing use of false identity as a standard mode of online behavior suggests a sort of self-loathing on a mass scale. It's as if we so hate the images we project that we feel compelled to detach our names from them. We know we're being mean-spirited, offensive, irrelevant, or noisome, so we cloak ourselves as bulldog and Z1X4Y and sniffin and peon. Still, to stay 
truly anonymous online is harder than most people think. It's easy to cook up a false identity in a matter of minutes. Giant free email services like Hotmail give out usable addresses for the asking. They require your name. But go ahead, tell them you're Boris Badenoff. They don't mind. They seem to be daring you. Netscape sometimes touts its mail service with the motto, send a nasty note to your boss. But people leave electronic footprints. Service providers usually have our credit card information. Web browsers give away more about your PC and your internet location than you might wish. Microsoft, which owns Hotmail, wants you to know that it's not meant as an anonymous email service. The service keeps its records associating users with their computer's internet addresses. The product manager says, you're traceable, and if you do something that's illegal or harmful, we have that history and we'll turn it over to law enforcement. But not everyone is sophisticated enough to know this. Not even everyone at Microsoft. Just a few days after she told me this, another Microsoft employee got caught using a Yahoo Mail account to masquerade as one Phil Bucking of Bucking Consulting, a fictional concerned citizen trying to sound a fictional alarm about security issues at America Online. So various companies are offering various high-tech solutions to this problem, the problem of imperfect anonymity. Zero-knowledge systems, for example, markets a product that promises to redefine identity on the internet and create authenticated digital pseudonyms that bear no necessary relation to the actual person behind them. It claims to use cryptography to cover your trail as you manage all your different identities. For example, the company suggests, if you like to debate politics online, you can designate one pseudonym as your politics pseudonym. Use it when you post in political news groups, surf activist websites, email your political contacts, and chat in political chat rooms. No one can trace it back to your real self if you even have a real self. Maybe now you have a new multiple personality disorder instead. A meager and unpleasant discourse emerges from the jousting of all these pseudonymous role players. Hardly anyone thinks that governments should try to regulate matters of identification online, nor is it likely that governments could, even if they wished to, Still, it's worth remembering that the internet is young. Much of its structure exists as pure accident. Widespread anonymity was not part of the plan when the basic protocols of internetworking were laid down. Openness prevailed. You could finger people electronically and see not only their names, but whether they were online and when they had last checked their mail. It would be entirely possible and eminently reasonable for individual internet service providers, which are private companies after all, to require their credit card carrying customers to use real names for their public activity. It's technically feasible for email servers to stamp outgoing messages with a valid return address. The various grotesque mutant species of electronic junk mail would probably wither away if this became a universal habit. For now, the senders use anonymity as a tool for invading your privacy. Too many masks. Maybe we can't really run from our names in this peculiar modern realm, or maybe we just won't like the neighborhood if we try. Now a new message arrives for one of my fictive selves. We have received a request to put this email account on hell.com's guest list, it advises. No thanks. I'll pass. Thank you. Now, if anyone has questions, I would be happy to try to answer them. Yes. Um, well, I was wondering if you could connect this to your first book, Chaos, because as you were talking, I was thinking about you know how chaos is eventually going to um, emerge, and then with all of this, that's all that you're talking about is like this one category, and and the the 
there's another category, I'm sure, when you see something on your inbox that you immediately go to, you know, you want to respond to. So that's how I, I'm trying to put an optimistic spin on this. Well, I'm optimistic about it. I, this wasn't a, this maybe wasn't a very optimistic sounding little passage to choose, but um, I love the chaos of the internet. It is cha it is chaotic, not in the, it's, uh, all right, it's not chaotic, I don't think, in the scientific sense that I was talking about in the first book, but it's, it certainly has been, over these past 10 years, unruly and disorganized and something that has emerged from the bottom up as a combination of behavior by millions of individuals as opposed to something that's been imposed or planned from the top down. And that's, for me, that's what's been so wonderful about it and, and the reason it's, it's been so successful. We have all these giant companies who own various kinds of media and they wanted to send us movies and uh, recorded music and all kinds of news and text, and it didn't occur to them that we were we as individual users were going to start creating this thing bubbling up from the bottom. I think that that is connected in a in a way to my first book. You seem to think it is. I don't know if I can really make a, a, a persuasive technical case for it, though. Talk at the beginning about. Necessarily the bubble. And I see it, I'm biased with this, I see it as a combination of, of a miracle and an illusion. And the miracle is that the, the marvelous amount of, of information, ideas, marketing, whatever, that can be generated through the internet. The illusion is that anybody can make a significant amount of money doing it. And that's where I think the bubble occurred was the idea that there was this extra normal return that could be generated by something where the barriers to entry are virtually zero. Well, I, I, I completely agree with that. That's, that certainly is true. It's, there was a lot of hype in certain circles. And if you're interested in finance, there were a lot of stocks that were overpriced and there were, and there were, a lot of companies with very high hopes and and twenty year olds with millions of dollars in stock options and and they turned out to be worthless and now a lot of a lot of hopeful people are unemployed and i don 't mean to to make light of that because for those people it's it was a serious business and um, so there was something there that seemed to go away, but in all of this period. When I was writing about the online world, this, the stuff that's, that makes up this book, I didn't care about the, the bubble. I didn't, I think if those of you who read the book will agree that I wasn't interested in whether Amazon.com was going to be a big financial success or, or in whether Netscape was going to be a successful company or, or any of those things. I was more interested in the, cultural and psychological issues of whether uh, whether Amazon.com was going to succeed in figuring out how to predict what kind of music I liked based on the books I was buying, which they're trying very hard to do. And I'm still more interested in that kind of thing. And and I think this is the stuff that matters. And I and I I really do believe that um, that the world has changed. And a lot of the hype that inspired companies to spend a lot of money reckless, recklessly was legitimate. I do think it's a new world and that the rules of economic behavior are going to be a little different. It's just they weren't quite as different as some people hoped in a very short period of time. Well, I'm not sure I agree with that, although I'm far from an expert. But wasn't it the same with the railroads and the Erie Canal and the telephone and Normal extension of that? Yes, I, I, I think that's I think that I think that's true. Overpricing, subsequent crash. This is normal in society. Yes, there's definitely something to that, and I and I I talk in my introduction about how how similar it 
it feels in a way. The, the last decade of this century, when this online revolution was taking place, to the last decade of the 1800s, when suddenly people were getting electricity and telephones in their homes. And it was exactly as you say. Right. And, and, and when these technologies arrived, it's not as if people didn't know that the world was changing. There was a lot of hype. People were very excited. They made wild predictions about the future. And we see now that these predictions came true. And we take the telephone for granted as, a, as, an, ins as an instrument of communication. Uh, 10 years ago, the telephone was just a dull device sitting at your bed on your bedside table. There didn't seem to be anything revolutionary about it, and yet it had transformed every part of our lives in ways that we don't even think about now. So, so yeah, it's the same thing all over again in a way. It's the same thing all but same thing in okay, and I and I see that as I see that as as cynical as you profess to be about it, you're carrying your cell phone with you. Okay. It's the only difference. I don't, mean, I, I, I don't reject technology or the advances. I just don't know the price of it, so I wouldn't buy it and try it. Okay, way to go. No, Charles McKay wrote about this in 1847. Sure. These same things happen over and over and over. He mentioned this the lands, Mississippi land, you know, coal works and tools. Well, we seem to go in these cycles of great expectation. Right, but I don't. I, that means if you're asking, I personally don't really believe that it's cycles, and I don't think it's exactly the same thing again. For one thing, these technological changes have occurred much more quickly than the arrival of the railroads and the telephone and electricity and the automobile, which took decades um, to um, to pervade. American society and 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 even longer in the rest of the world. Uh, it, you know, it was less than it was less than ten years ago that um, people barely had fax machines and had basically never conceived of the idea of of email. And it was considered rude to to pull a telephone out of your pocket at a, while you're listening to a public lecture. And um, these changes have have been quicker. And I think they are truly profound and important, which doesn't mean that it's the first time that the world has changed or new technologies have arrived. And we'll see. We'll see and then we'll forget. No. Because I, now I'm wondering if, if a lot of this is, yes, it's happening faster, but is it making us be, be forced to be more knowledgeable about the information that we have? So again, going back to, you can see spam, you see it, and you say, that's, you know, uh, that's, that's no use to me. But we really, it's, it's forcing us to say, what's important and what isn't. And the, the issue of choice, that's been a community issue for a long time. Yeah, all, all of that is true. And I emphasized the, the spam and the <laughs> ugly behavior and, and that side of things and, and kind of promised not to say how wonderful the internet is and, and what a wonderful resource it is for students and journalists like me. But, but it really is amazing. The, the nearly instantaneous access you have to information when you need information. I, I really, I don't want to sound like a proselytizer for it, but I believe in this stuff. And yet, the ambivalence that we feel about trying to sift the wheat from the chaff is important and legitimate. One, one person I quote in my book who I talked to early, early in this decade was Arno Penzias, the the uh, physicist who was the head of Bell Labs, who said, the age of information transparency hasn't arrived yet. 
the way you'll know when it has arrived is when somebody tells you, I can get you 10 times as much information, and you think that's good news, then, then the age of information transparency will be here. Yeah. Yes, there are there are always people trying to trying to find technological solutions to these technological problems, but they but they don't work. None of them work. No, and I've I've spent a lot of time trying to make them work. And my my advice for everyone here is don't hold out any hope for a perfect technological solution. Well, well just to give you one example, I heard. I heard the other day about a, a pornography filter that was rejecting um, rejecting resumes where the sender listed as part of his educational attainment a degree he achieved cum laude. Okay, the rest of you will will think about it, and it'll come to you later. <laughs> right. One more question? No? Okay. <laughs> the, the last word. I think that's right. I think there is there is this amazing tension now between our feeling of being overwhelmed by a flood of information that that comes in in the form of facts, and not only are they facts that are um, apparently uh, sometimes disconnected, but they're facts that are often unreliable, which is part of the point of of the passage I read. So not only do you have to organize this welter of information, but you have to have to throw away the stuff that's that's dishonest or fraudulent. Tension between that and as I think you're saying, the the challenge that that even kids feel to to be active gatherers of information and actually learn new methods of making sense of it. And as kids are doing it, so are businesses. You know, successful businesses might be the ones that, that really figure out how to give us tools, um, not just for throwing away the spam before it gets to us, but for finding the, the stuff that we're really looking for, you know, like, like Google or like its inevitable successors. Okay, one more. Well, it was. It didn't start as a book. It started as uh, it started as journalism, and I, I wrote. I was writing for the New York Times Magazine and for some other publications, and for a while I was writing a regular column. And at f part of the point of the book is to show how my own. Perceptions of things changed in this very short period. You know, at first it wasn't clear what was happening. I knew that something was happening and I didn't know what. And you can see mistakes I made during the 10 years. The articles are dated. And then by the end, I was starting to feel that there was a sort of coherent picture emerging and that it was worthwhile collecting this writing and making something coherent out of it. And whether I was right, you can judge for yourself. Thank you all. Thank you. Thanks for listening. 
For more information on the 92nd Street Y New York and all of our programs, please visit us at 92ny.org.